Good morning. Welcome to Parkville Presbyterian Church, a place where everyone is loved and everyone belongs. Whether you're joining us online or in person this morning, we're glad that you're here and part of our circle. Today we continue our worship series, A Generous Heritage. From now until November 13th, we will use scripture as a lens to examine the past, present, and future of Parkville Presbyterian Church. Building on the foundation of our 177-year heritage, how do we contribute to God's call now and in the future, and what is God calling us to in this chapter of our history? Over the coming weeks, we'll talk about the many different contributions we make to the holy work done in this space and by this people. We'll ask you to consider your financial generosity with the church, both for 2022 as the year draws to a close and for 2023 as we prepare a budget for next year's ministries. The effort will culminate on November 13th when we dedicate your financial pledges on a special dedication Sunday. Of course, we contribute to God's work in this space with much more than financial generosity. We also contribute our time, our energy, our love, our prayers. The church is hosting a trunk or treat on Saturday, October 29th from 3 to 6 p.m. as part of a whole day of spooky festivities throughout Parkville. To help out, you can invite kids you know to our trunk or treat and help them get here on Saturday. You can also donate candy in the bin in the narthex and volunteer your time or your trunk. You can contact Joy Shrimpshire or Molly Braun or me to learn more about that. Another collection happening in the narthex is for the unhoused people in our world. The risk-taking mission team is constructing care bags that you and I can give to people without homes. We can keep them in our cars. We can look out for when we see people in need and give out those bags. You can pitch in by donating bottled water, personal hygiene items, or non-perishable food items. In November, the mission team will put, together, will put together the bags so that you can hand them out to someone in need. The final event I'll mention today is election hospitality. With the political climate in our society, voting can sometimes feel less like a joy and more like an onerous obligation. We hope to change the tone of election day by offering something different to the voters who encounter PPC on that day. Through a warm smile, a good cookie, and a sense of community, we'll do our part to attempt to restore communal bonds and help our country get back together again. You can participate by contacting Susan Rose, signing up on the sheet in the narthex, or calling the church office to learn more. And with that said, we come to a moment of this place in history, this place in time. We're looking back to the present, we're thinking about the present, we're looking back to the past, we're thinking about the present and the future. In the moment, we are here for worship, let us worship God together. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. May God be gracious to us and bless us. And make the Lord's face to shine upon us, that the way of God may be known upon the earth. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. God is the creator of the world and the source of every blessing in our lives. Let us rise in body or in spirit for hymn number 475. Come thou fount of every blessing.
The heritage of our church is a history of faith responding to new challenges. Guided by the Holy Spirit and with Christ in the lead, Parkville Presbyterian Church has lived through poverty, debt, a civil war, pandemics, and societal change. Through the gift of faith, we persevered through it all and continued to serve our community and proclaim God's love. Still, in the face of modern stresses, we often forget the gift of faith. We think the challenges we face as a church and in our lives are too much for us or that we are not enough for them. When we forget who we are and who we belong to, we can confess our forgetfulness to God and receive a new memory of faith in turn. Let us confess our sins, first using the prayer printed in our bulletin, and then in a holy moment of quiet prayer. Let us pray. Lord of life and Lord of light, you are the source of illumination who guides the steps we take. At times, we forget that you are in the lead. We believe the whole endeavor is in our hands and that it rises and falls with us. We worry the challenges are insurmountable and that we are too small to meet them. Remind us that we are yours, that you provide what we need, and that you are the light who guides us. Help us to live with the gift of faith so that we may see you already at work. Act with courage when you act through us and remember who we are as your people. Amen. Friends, let us remember who we are. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And now, as forgiven children of God, reconciled to God, and prepared to reconcile with each other, let us exchange the peace of Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you, and also with you.
At this time, we invite our young disciples to come forward for a time that's just for them. Good morning, kids. Good to see you all today. Can I have a baby? Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. So, I wanted to tell you all a bit about the history of our church. Um, do you know how long this has been a church? Uh, 80 years? 18 something and something, yeah. 80 years? 80 years, yeah. That's actually, well, so we've been in this building for about 72 years. And we've been a church for 177 years. What? That's almost 200, yeah. You got about 23 more years to go before it's year 200. <laughs> so 177 years is a long time. And one of the things that I think is most interesting about the early part of the history of the church is that there were a lot of times where it looked like it wasn't gonna go on for very long. So we were founded in 1845. Four years, and, and the first sort of founding, there were six members. By 1849, there were three members. So three people left? Yeah, so three people left, so there were only three people there. How do you think they got from three to this many people? What do you think, Henry? The people who were here started, started telling their friends, and then all of their friends started telling their other friends, so everybody kept joining. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. So the, those three people started telling their friends, and then those people's friends told their people's friends, and that led to something. Because, like, um, maybe because, like, in the older days, maybe they didn't believe in God as much, but now they kind of, like, spread the word and stuff, and now they, like, accumulated people. Maybe. Yeah, so, so maybe in the older days, people didn't believe in God as much, but things changed as they went on. Malcolm, you had a thought? Maybe. I forgot. But I'm... Okay. Well, if you remember it, let me know. You know, one thing we tend to think when we look I back, remember. you remembered? Okay. So Henry said if they did it to their friends, but what if they were spreading it to even people that they didn't know? So Whoa, like they, what, what if they talked even to people that they didn't know? That's really interesting. That's a good thought. Okay, yeah, so good thoughts all. Um, you know, we tend to think when we look back on, on history that people back in the old days, well, well, everybody went to church and everybody was part of a church. But actually, back in the 1840s, only about 45% of people in America were part of churches. So there were a lot of people who didn't go to churches back then. But yeah, I think maybe through people telling their friends, um, through things in the town changing and getting better so that there was more stability in the town. Um, and I think even through people just talking to strangers and saying, hey, I've got something important in my life and I wanna tell you about it. Maybe it could be important to you too. Um, all of that happened and they went from three people. We went from three people in 1849 to 168 people today. So it went six to straight to this many people? 168, yeah. 168? Yep, that's how many members we have today. So that's a lot of members. That's a lot of members, that's exactly right. Members. Yeah. Okay, so the lesson for all of us is to share what we have with our friends, share what we have so that other people can know that this is a good thing and that we really connect with God here and that it means a lot to us and we want it to mean a lot to other people too. Will you all say a word of prayer with me? Yeah. God, we give you thanks for bringing us together and making us a family in your name. We pray that you will lead us to share our faith 
and help us to be people who spread your word. Amen. All right, thank you all. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 11 to 15. Like our historical church, the biblical church of Philippi was founded on a river, and these are its founding moments. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace. The following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river where we supposed was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. 
the Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she prevailed upon us. Holy wisdom, holy words, thanks be to God. On April 27, 1845, six people signed the charter and became founding members of the Presbyterian Church of Parkville. To mark the occasion, Reverend Wright, Reverend Wright came down from the much larger town of Weston to give a sermon. Reverend Lord, a missionary based in Parkville, was there as well. At the time, the town of Parkville was barely a chicken scratch in the dirt of the Missouri frontier. Six years prior, in 1839, George Park had purchased the land for what would eventually become the town from David English. English had built a landing for riverboats here, hence English Landing, if, if you hadn't made that connection. But George Park imagined the area could be something more than that, something more than just a riverboat landing. So Park divided the land into plots and began the work of attracting owners and tenants to try to build a full-fledged town. However, by 1845, many of those plots remained unoccupied. Still, there was a Sabbath school and a Bible class in Parkville. The people may not have had their own church, but they were gathering for faith formation and organizing their own Christian education. And there were other religious happenings. Reverend Wright, the minister from Weston, would occasionally come to the nascent town to preach a sermon. Every once in a while, a Methodist circuit rider or a Baptist brother would offer a word. In those days, travel from one town to another was a huge undertaking, and the people of Parkville were not equipped to simply travel to another town each week to go to worship. In those days, if they wanted their kids to get a good education, they would send them to school in Liberty, and sending your kids all the way there was like sending them to boarding school. You weren't going to see them for a few months if you had to send them all the way to Liberty. And Reverend White, Reverend Wright, when he made the trip down from Weston, that was a huge undertaking as well. It simply wouldn't do to travel to another town to find religion. The Sabbath school and the Bible class weren't enough either. They wanted a church, and a Presbyterian one at that. So on April 27, 1845, six people signed the charter and became founding members of the Presbyterian Church of Parkville. One of them was George Park, the owner of the town. Another was Harriet Parsons, his sister. Two married couples also signed the charter, the Stevens and the Panics. Park and another man, Mr. Stevens, were elected as the first two elders. In our scripture reading this morning, we witness the founding of another church on a river. Paul and his companions had set sail from Troas, a city in modern-day Turkey that, even back then, was rumored to be the site of the mythical city of Troy. Paul and his companions had set sail from Troas and wound up in Philippi, a city in modern-day northern Greece. Philippi was a Roman colony meaning that it was a town of retired soldiers who had been promised land by the empire, often to fulfill their promises to those who survived in uniform and to help Romanize a newly conquered area. The Roman Empire would settle its retired soldiers into colonies on the frontier. In Philippi, other aspects of civilization soon grew up around the frontier colony. People moved there to marry retired soldiers or to provide the area with commerce. By the time Paul and his companions arrived, there was a small community of Jewish worshipers who had began to gather on Sabbath days outside of town. They weren't large enough to have a synagogue, but they had a prayer house out on the river outside of town. It was something like the Sabbath school that was in the nascent town of Parkville. You see, when the Apostle Paul first arrived in a new place, he would find the Jewish worshipers. 
These are the people who are most connected to his tradition and most equipped to receive the news that Jesus is the one to worship as the Messiah. <clears throat> In Philippi, these worshipers gathered by a river outside of town. They likely did not have a synagogue because there may not have been enough men in town to form a quorum for a synagogue. But at the prayer house, Paul and his companions met Lydia, who was a dealer in expensive textiles. She was a person of wealth. She had enough social standing to manage her own household so that she could invite Paul and his companions to stay with her without asking a man for permission. It's not unreasonable to think that Lydia might have put up the funds to build that prayer house along a river on a frontier town. It's not unreasonable to think of her as the George Park of Philippi or to think of him as the Lydia of Parkville. Once the Presbyterian Church of Parkville was founded in 1845, it was hardly smooth sailing from there. As I mentioned before, Parkville was barely a chicken scratch in the frontier and many of its plots were unoccupied. Due to poor frontier sanitation, epidemics swept the region. An early history of the church noted that for many months in that first year, there was no preaching in the town of any kind. There was, there, everyone was exceedingly sick here and throughout all the West, great numbers died. There was neither health nor strength to attend to the institutions of the gospel. And so even with their own church, the realities of frontier life sometimes prevented faithful people from gathering. In addition to that, there were a lot of unfaithful people. Early ministers wrote letters to friends and benefactors in the East, complaining about high levels of drinking, high levels of immorality, and great disinterest in religion. According to one early minister, the people of Parkville felt they were living nowhere, out of sight of God and men and not subject to the rules of civilization. Between disease and despair and a land that was hard to work and even harder to profit from, some of the founding members of the church left town. Soon they were down to three members and only one remaining elder. I would urge you, I would urge you to remember that if you are ever tempted to think that 168 members is not enough. At one point, the church was down to three members, but where two or three are gathered in Christ's name, he is with them. By March 1849, when the Reverend George Woodward arrived, the Presbyterian Church of Parkville was a makeshift affair. For Woodward's first communion service, George Park supplied the elements for the Lord's Supper. Park came to church in a red overcoat with a black fringe, in one pocket, a bottle of wine, and in the other, two blue tumblers. The bread was wrapped up in paper. The communion table was a board placed on benches in a brick schoolhouse. I would urge you to remember that if you are ever tempted to think that worship is not formal enough, or that informality automatically means disrespect of tradition. In some cases, informality is the tradition especially out here on the frontier. Soon enough, with faith, prayer, and hard work, things would turn around for our church. In the 1850s, with Reverend Woodward at the pulpit and George Park as a benefactor, the church grew. Soon there were six elders and a rotation of trustees. By 1852, the church had approximately 40 members and around 100 people in worship. The church was able to build its own building the stone church that you see on the cover of your bulletin. In 1854, the church welcomed two African-American members into, into its ranks. In 1854, the church welcomed two African-American members into its ranks, likely William and Angeline Washington, and we baptized the couple's four children. The Washingtons would later be the namesakes of the Washington Chapel CME Church, a historically African-American church on West Street in Parkville. So eventually the couple would feel compelled to leave this body and to found their own. Perhaps they were influenced by the troubles that were soon to come and the church's response to them. But for a time in 1854, this church took the radical step of welcoming African-American members 
And even if that time was short-lived, it demonstrates an inclusive spirit and the faith to take risks on behalf of inclusion that is part of the DNA of this place. I would urge you to remember that in the future as you strive to balance fellowship for current members with inclusion of new ones. Remember that including new people means taking risks. It means stepping aside. It means letting new people introduce us to new ways and new practices. If we do it right, new members will change us and we will welcome the change. Now, getting back to history. The 1850s were a time of growth and prosperity for both Parkville, the city, and Parkville, the church. But then the border troubles began. In Kansas, there was armed conflict between pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces. The violence often spilled across the border into Missouri, and George Park, a noted abolitionist, was a target of that violence. In 1855, a pro-slavery mob invaded Parkville, kidnapped the editor of George Park's newspaper, and hurled his printing press into the river. Soon, Park left town. He had other properties in Texas, Illinois, Kansas, and he felt he would be happier in one of those other places. In fact, when Park left town in 1855, he took the church's largest annual gift along with him, and he had no plans to return to the town that bore his name. The church was sometimes a target of violence as well, but in the face of all these troubles, the church took a stance of neutrality. They did not stand courageously in favor of the abolition of slavery. They complained, they complained about being seen as abolitionists when they were striving to remain lukewarm on the subject. The church records do not indicate when William and Angeline Washington, those African American members, left the church, but I imagine it was around this time, and that is a problematic moment in our history. I would urge you to remember that. I would urge you to remember that when you consider the possibility of taking a stand in favor of inclusion. When you have the opportunity to take a stand in favor of inclusion, but you falter or hesitate because it seems like too much, like standing up for a small group might alienate the majority and drive people away. In the 1850s, the church did not stand up for its African American members. And in the 1860s, it fell on hard times. People moved away from Parkville. Church members scattered and found it difficult to meet. George Park returned, and that was good news, but he returned to a church in shambles where most of the gains of the previous decade had been lost. The church was also mired in debt from previous building projects. In fact, by 1884, we would trade our building in exchange for debt relief so that by 1884, the church had no debt, but also no building. I would urge you to remember that as you think about this building, this building that we're sitting in this morning. This is a good structure. It has stood for 72 years and been well-maintained. It will stand for decades to come, and the church has faithfully paid the mortgage we hold on this building. There's no reason to think that we'll lose this space. But if we do, if some kind of worst case scenario happens and the church loses this building, we've lived without a building before. Even without its own physical structure, the church goes on because the church is not a building, it is people gathered in faith. As we transition from the past to the present, we recognize that we stand on a new frontier today. First of all, we should recognize that that period of the founding period of the church was a period of so many ups and downs for this place, was a period of so many moments where you could have blinked and the church would have gone out of existence. So many moments when we were hanging on by the thinnest of threads. And yet there were people who came forward, people who stepped forward in faith, people who kept working, despite whatever their feelings may have been, 
people who said, you know what, God has some kind of plan here, and I am called to be a part of that plan. And so in those early periods, you see this movement back and forth between prosperity and despair, between barely hanging on to the thinnest threads of survival, and between huge seasons of growth and abundance. That has always been a part of the history of the church. Seasons of prosperity, seasons of decline, seasons of new growth, seasons where things seem to fall apart. But the lesson of all that is that where two or three are gathered in Christ's name, he is there. Where two or three are gathered in Christ's name, he is there. You heard our kids talking earlier this morning. Take three people, have them go out and tell their friends. Have their friends go out and tell their friends. There's something to that. That faith can continue to inspire us, continue to move in us. Christ continues to move in us despite whatever the ups and downs of good or bad fortune might be. Even after the devastation of the 1860s, even after they lost their building in 1884, the church grew again. After 1884, the church met for a time in a college student chapel at a hotel downtown. They met for a time in the Methodist church building because they had a building at that point. They met for a time in places that were a bit makeshift, because that's what their faith called them to do, until they had a new space to call their own. Where two or three are gathered in Christ's name and willing to offer faith, prayer, and hard work, all things are possible. Indeed, with faith the size of a mustard seed, three people can move mountains. With all the people gathered here today, how much more is Christ in our midst? How much more can God do with us if we are willing to give our time, our talent, our love, our resources? How many people can God reach through us? With all of us working together in faith, what will God be able to accomplish through this church? Amen. Let us rise in body or in spirit to sing our responsive hymn, number 305, Come Sing, O Church, Enjoy.
hearts we do, what joys and concerns do we have to lift up to God? Uh, yes, Randy? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Amen. So Randy notes the soon-to-be-retired Reverend Jim Gordon of Pine Ridge Presbyterian Church. Um, his last Sunday with Pine Ridge will be November 6th, I believe. And uh, Randy notes that he met Jim not only through Presbyterian circles, but also through his son and Jim's son playing in a band together. We wish the best for Jim and his cancer journey as he continues on for, for recovery, for healing, for strength. Uh, we also wish the best for him in retirement. So we give thanks for his ministry and we pray for him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Uh, Joyce, I saw your hand. Okay. Joyce offers prayers of thanks. Her son is coming home from South America on Monday for three months. She also offers prayers of supplication for God to grow the church in the Holy Spirit and for the Holy Spirit to, to move in this place and to continue moving. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Uh, yes, Anna? Fair enough. We pray for Anna's teacher who recently had hip surgery and is coming back on Monday. We pray for a continued recovery and strength for her. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Are there others? Yes, Lisa? For, for Mary, who is in the final stages of a battle with cancer, for all those who know her and support her and love her, we pray that God will watch over her and that God will give her a peaceful journey. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Are there others? Carrie? Carrie offers prayers of thanksgiving for the Parkville Living Center Town Hall that was here on Tuesday and prayers as election season nears that people will remember the rights of the most vulnerable and the rights of women and their voting choices. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. I'll offer a prayer of thanksgiving. Marcus had an amazing week this week. I remember Marcus Flores. So on Tuesday, we had the Parkville Living Center Town Hall here. There were at least 40 people present in person, including whoever was here online. This had been in, slated to be a candidate forum, but we had first one Republican candidate and then another Republican candidate drop out of the forum. And so instead we had a conversation on civility, we had a conversation on how is it that we get together and have conversations again? How is it that we get to the point where we can talk to each other? And so Marcus very nimbly navigated through some unexpected changes in the program in order to help to put something together that was of great value to our community. So I give thanks to God for that. On Wednesday morning, he then went to Park University and was part of a panel on homelessness with a variety of other community leaders. On Friday, we then had Parkville Living Center break time where we gave your donations of winter coats and other winter wear to Park University International students and just had another great time of gathering in community. 
for your part in organizing all that. I am grateful to God. So, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Marty? Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Marty offers prayers. Marty offers prayers for longtime members of the church who are no longer able to come on Sunday morning, that they not be forgotten. Um, Nancy Ebert, Dixie Selvage, Judy Seifert, Jerry Lowry, Clarence Lowry, sorry? Marty Miller, Jack Miller. Yeah. There are probably a few that we're forgetting here, but that just illustrates the point that we need to not forget those folks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Henry? Okay. We pray for Henry's grandpa, Jack, who is getting surgery on his foot. We pray that he'll have healing and strength and recovery. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. Let us continue in, uh, yes, Jane. Yeah. For the people of Ukraine and for all who are involved in that conflict, we pray for peace. We pray for rebuilding. We pray that the war will come to an end and that peace will reign. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us continue in prayer. God, we give you thanks for the gifts you give us each day. We give you thanks for gathering us together and helping us to see your will and your way. We give you thanks for the light that guides our steps. We give you thanks for the faith that gives us courage. We pray that you will watch over us. In times where we feel despair more than anything, in times where we feel hopelessness, in times that are uncertain and unforgiving, we pray, O oh Lord, that you will bolster us with the strength we need. We pray that you will give us the courage we need. We pray that you will give us the vision we need so that we may be a part of healing so that we may be agents of reconciliation, so that we may help to bring love into the world. We pray for all those we know who are in need of physical healing. We pray for those who have wounds that are both seen and unseen, visible and invisible. We pray that you will heal those who need your healing and that to the extent that we can be a part of that healing, to the extent that we can partner with you to be a part of the change that needs to be. May we be called and may we answer your call to go where you would have us go. Lord, we conclude this prayer with the one your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the Thursday before the Sunday, when Jesus rose again, he was having supper with his closest friends. And he gave us a ritual to remember him. It was a ritual that recalled all the times that he gathered around a table with people during his ministry. A ritual to remember all those times when he gathered with people. Times when everyone was welcome. Times when no one was turned away. Times when all you had to do was be hungry and thirsty in order to dine with Christ. And so we have this table here, which is for all who hunger and all who thirst. This table where there are no borders, there are no boundaries, this table where all are welcome, to remind us that Christ is here, that all are welcome to come to Christ, and that in this meal we can be filled, we can be sustained, we can be made ready for the journey ahead. 
When he had that supper with his friends, there was a moment when Christ picked up a loaf of bread. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. As often as you share bread together, remember me. In the same way, he took a cup and poured it out. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in the substance of my life. As often as you share this cup together, remember me. Will the servers please come forward at this time? As the servers come forward, I would offer a reminder of that early moment in the history of the church when they had a communion service and the person who brought the elements came with a bottle of wine in one pocket, two blue tumblers in the other. The communion table that morning was a board stretched over a couple of benches in a brick schoolhouse. And yet still, that was the communion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And yet still, when we come forward to this table, we are connected with those people back then because they were connecting with Jesus, and so are we, and that means we're connected to each other. And so we come to this place of connection, this place of relationship, this place where all are welcome, this place where we are connected beyond boundaries, beyond borders, beyond anything else that might separate us, because this is the communion of Jesus Christ. He may come forward at this time.
Parkville Presbyterian Church has stood as a witness to the love of God since 1845. But when the cornerstone of our building was laid in 1948, we were known as Parkville Community Church. At the time, we had members from many denominations and a variety of walks of life, and we still do. Today, the church is one of the rare spaces of common ground in our society, where Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives, and people of all races, classes, and identities can find a place. If preserving this space is important to you, please contribute to its upkeep through a gift in the offering plate or through one of the means listed in your bulletin. You can also make a financial pledge for 2023 by placing a card in the offering plate or sending a card by mail to the church. However we give and whatever we give, may all our gifts be used by God for love, service, and praise. Let us pray. Lord, we lift these gifts along with our whole lives up to you. May we remember that we are yours and follow where you would have us to go. Amen. Faith is a gift from God and it cannot be shaken by any challenge. No matter how insurmountable it seems, Faith is a gift from God, and it cannot be shaken, not even by the forces of hell. Our final hymn today is number 463, How Firm a Foundation. <laughs>
Let us go forth full of faith, ready to be who God has called us to be, ready to go where God has called us to go, ready to do the work that needs to be done. Amen.